This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV. And as Robert Allen Limited celebrates its 90th anniversary, we're really pleased to be joined by Robert G. Allen, the executive chairman, and Mike Fitzpatrick, the president and CEO, for insights on the company to date and the pace and the direction of its future. Robert, just to start, did you always know that yours would be a career in maritime following in the footsteps of your father and grandfather? I'm, I'm not sure that I always knew that, uh, Greg, but uh, I really didn't have much of a genetic chance. You know, my, my father and grandfather were both naval architects. My, my other grandfather was a steam engineer and uh, I kind of just grew up with salt water in my veins. Um, the only time I ever kind of wavered from that, even in, in grade school, the teacher would ask you, you know, are you going to be a fireman or a policeman or a doctor? And I'd put up my hand and say, I'm going to be a naval architect. And of course, no grade school teacher ever knew what a naval architect was. But um, yeah, I think I always did it. In my, in my teen years, I was quite keen on architecture. And, and when I was 15 or 16, I used to design houses and just muck about with that. And I, I recall asking my father um, at one stage, maybe, maybe I'll just become a, an architect architect instead of a naval architect. And my father, who was a very wise man, said, yeah, you could, you could do that and, and become one of tens of thousands of starving architects. Or you could stick with the marine side and get to be a big fish in a, in a little pond. And that was turned out to be pretty prophetic. And uh, so, yeah, I, the die was cast, I think. And uh, boy, I have no regrets whatsoever. When you look at how the company is most the same and most different from when it was started in 1930, uh, how, is it, how has it evolved? Well, let's start with the differences because uh, they're, they're a lot easier to identify. And, you know, I have, I've spent a lot of time since I so-called retired uh, a couple of years ago, I've been spending a lot of time really trying to document the, the early uh, history of the company and, and in particular bringing the archives up to date because the record keeping in the 30s and 40s was not good. Um, but, you know, what, what's, what's different, obviously, you know, we've, we've started out as a one-man operation working out of a, a basement office that became two men and then gradually they hired odd draftsmen here and there. But you know, we've involved, evolved to a company of 90 some odd people with a, with a global outreach. So you know, that just the size of the business has changed dramatically. Our, our focus uh, has changed from being very local to truly global. Um, the, way we do business is totally different you know they evolved from all manual drafting obviously and manual calculations to a completely computerized and very high-tech kind of operating environment um, and uh, our probably one of the most invisible changes but most important changes is is how we work. Our work now is much more structured and, and detailed. You know, we're working to ISO standards and in, in how we document all of our design work and design decisions. That makes record keeping for future uh, look backs on the business infinitely easier than what I'm going through at the moment. But what's the same is, you know, our subject matter is still to, you know, has never really changed very much from being focused um, purpose design workbooks. And I think most importantly, you know, my, my grandfather and I think particularly my father set a tone for the way in which we do business, uh, you know, working honestly and with, with integrity with all of our clients and everybody that we have business relationships with. And, and I'm really pleased to say that I think that's something the company is really identified for. And, so th and I hope that will never change. Uh, obviously, with decarbonization, digitalization, and autonomy, you know, I would contend that the maritime industry is in a transcendent period. That's my opinion. Of course, I would like yours. Um, 
Can you put in perspective the changes that you see now and in the coming generation, and more importantly, put them in, in perspective and context to other periods of change that you've seen in your career? Decarbonization is certainly something that's at uh, the forefront of a lot of the projects we're working on now, uh, and it presents probably the biggest challenge uh, to the industry right now. Um, mainly because it's really difficult to make the economics of decarbonization uh, work in a, a particularly in small uh, work boats with uh, like tugs that have uh, very expensive machinery in them. Um, the capital cost difference of a low carbon uh, tugboat, for instance, is, uh, you know, typically on the order of 30 uh, percent more expensive than a, a typical diesel mechanical tub. Uh, the tugs don't generally burn enough uh, fuel or operate enough hours um, to make a, a strong financial uh, argument as to uh, decarbonizing. So uh, we're still uh, while we've done numerous LNG fuel tugs, d uh, dual fuel tugs, hybrid tugs, they've pretty much all been done when there is a um, some outside source uh, providing incentive to have it done. On the subject of uh, digitalization, it's certainly the one that's um, made the biggest difference uh, in in our in how we do things in the last decade, and I, I think we'll continue to do so. Um, I think a couple of examples of how uh, digitalization is changing uh, the production, de the design development and production of uh, commercial workboats. Uh, one example would be in the shipyards where, you know, in the past, a typical shipyard might have spent 5,000 hours uh, working on the production level design, um, and then spend 100,000 hours building a, a tugboat. Um, our, our more advanced and most efficient shipyards nowadays spend 15,000 hours on a really detailed production model um, and are able to then spend instead only 60 or 70,000 hours on the construction of the tug. And they've made all the, all the difficult decisions, they've worked out all the problems, in the digital space before they even start cutting steel. Uh, made for a, a considerable improvement in the, in the quality of production by having everything so well modeled in, um, in the early production stage. So there's certainly been a, a lot of media attention to autonomous vessels in the past decade. Um, a lot more media attention than perhaps from owners. So we have actively been working on uh, autonomous vessels. We have some uh, projects that have progressed to various stages of development, um, but it is a going to be a slow adoption process. And um, we see it uh, not necessarily autonomous vessels as first remotely operated vessels and semi-autonomous vessels. Um, we're focused primarily on ways, uh, areas and operations where an autonomous vessel offers a obvious advantage. Uh, and this in particular are hazardous operations like firefighting um, or on the other side, very monotonous, uncom or, uh, monotonous uncomfortable ones for crews like a tanker holdback duties vessel. So. I don't see anytime soon uh, autonomous vessels replacing tugboats for typical operations. Um, but what I would hope to see is like uh, we see in the automotive industry is some of the technologies that are being developed to uh, allow autonomous operation being integrated into manned vessels to improve the safety and uh, ability of crews uh, to be a little more comfortable. So of all the challenges, uh, that you see in the industry today. Is there one that stands out head and shoulders above other as the biggest challenge? And if so, could you explain? Well, I, I think the, um, the one that I touched on earlier is finding 
uh, economically viable ways to reduce the uh, environmental impact of the, ves the operating vessels. Um, it's particularly challenging, I think, for, for tugboats. Um, you know, we, uh, we do know that the solution that works uh, one area isn't necessarily the, the right solution for another one. And so um, we've just finished the development of a purely battery electric uh, tugboat for uh, an operation here in, in Canada and British Columbia. And even with the cleanest, cheapest power, uh, I think we have the cleanest, cheapest power in the world here. And even then it's really difficult to, to build a, a, an economic case as to uh, why an owner should do this. So I think as you both might agree, uh, one of the challenges is grooming the next generation, whether we're talking about vessel designers, vessel builders, vessel operators. If you could, what advice would you give to a young person that's considering a career in maritime today? But, you know, there are, there are so many really interesting technical challenges today that it's, it's actually a really exciting time to, to be in it. And, and I see that continuing for at least the next kind of generation. You know, we've got 20 or 25 years before we are all supposed to be carbon neutral. Um, and, and as Mike has outlined, there are, there are huge technical challenges to overcome in this kind of smaller vessel category. It's not so difficult to achieve some of those things in, in much bigger vessels where you've got more space um, and, and very uh, high utilization of power uh, on, on a long voyage. Um, our, our market is, is very different. But you know, we you still need to understand the fundamentals of ship design and, and machinery design. Um, but I think that's going to take second place to understanding and coming up with new and innovative solutions that will will lead us to the this ultimate low carbon solution that that we're all looking for. So you know, I would encourage young budding engineers to really focus on that side of the business. I, that's, that's where the, uh, the demand is going to be for the next few years, for sure. One of the things I certainly noticed um, that made me uh, think I had made the right decision to uh, pursue naval architecture as an engineering uh, discipline. Uh, when I was going to university in Australia, it was the naval architecture program was uh, sort of co-operated with the aeronautical engineering program. And there were, I think, 60 uh, students in the aeronautical program and six in the naval architecture one. Um, and on the job boards, um, there were three jobs for aeronautical engineers and seven for naval architects. So I figured those were, uh, those were pretty good odds. And uh, I think the same is probably still true today. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in the marine industry internationally. So, Nine decades, obviously, is quite an achievement for any business today. I know there are many throughout your history, but when you look back, what do you consider your company's greatest achievement? Uh, how much time did you say we have, Greg? Well, as I say, you know, I've, I've been really immersed in the, in the corporate history for, for the last uh, year or so, and particularly in these COVID isolated times, I've really been digging into this. Um, and, and I've discovered a lot of projects that I, I didn't know about. Um, and, but I think, you know, first and foremost, surviving for 90 years as a continuous business is is a pretty significant achievement um, and and particularly when one looks at starting a business at the beginning of the Great Depression and surviving those dirty 30s um, as a as a one-man enterprise and I and I certainly know that that was an extremely difficult and discouraging time for my grandfather who was an extremely talented and ambitious 
and, and very proud man. And, uh, you know, there was a couple of years in the early 30s there where I think his total earnings were in the low hundreds of dollars. So, uh, but he, you know, he didn't, he didn't have enough money to go back to his home in Scotland and, and connect up there. Otherwise, I think he may have. Uh, I'm very thankful that he didn't because I probably wouldn't be here. But, uh, so, you know, just, just surviving in business through those early years uh, is, is a very notable achievement. Um, in the, the 1960s were a really formative period in the history of our company. And my father was really sort of running the business uh, by, by the early 60s. And it was a transformative time here in British Columbia, uh, where uh, with the benefit of a fairly significant national shipbuilding subsidy, owners were replacing their old wooden tug fleets with more modern diesel powered steel tugs uh, and, and building new and innovative types of barges. Our, our entire coastal economy is run on tug and barge. There are no ships on this coast. We have, we have ferries that move people in cars and we've got tugs and barges. So it's, a, it's a big industry here. And, and most of that uh, was developed in the 60s and my father designed 80, 85% of it. And, and a lot of those boats are still in service today. So I think that really laid the foundation for the type of business that, that we are. Self-loading, self-dumping log barges were developed in this office. And the first widespread use of court nozzles in, in North America were developed here. My father was the first global licensee for, for court in the, in the early 60s. Um, we did the first ice-breaking supply vessels for work in the Beaufort Sea uh, and, and, and on and on. You know, lots of really innovative, creative design work. Uh, that, that, as I say, laid the foundation for the kind of business we are. In the, in the 90s, and, and this, I always say it was really kind of a serendipitous development, but um, I had, when I took over the business from my father after his death in the early 80s, um, you know, I, so sort of looking at you know where is our business opportunities coming from, and I I had really kind of ruled out Europe and ruled out Asia because there was a lot of competition in our field, um, and you know we didn't really have the means to sort of try and penetrate that market, and we were reasonably comfortable with our kind of local business, but kind of out of the blue we got this connection with. Uh, owners and shipyards in Turkey. And, and that uh, was good for them, it was good for us, and, and, and our business just mushroomed as a consequence of that. It gave us a foothold with, with user clients in Europe and, and with these amazing shipyards in, in Turkey. Um, and that's, that has transformed our business uh, a hundredfold over what it was before and, and given us a, a global outlook. So that, that probably the major development. But I, ultimately at, at the end of the day, the, the thing I think of, of which I am most proud is, is how we made the transition from this being a single family owned company to uh, an employee owned company under first Ken Harford's direction and for the last what, five years now, Mike, four or five years under Mike's direction. To be able to move the company over to the ownership of the people with whom I worked many for 20 years or more, absolutely fantastic. And, it, and it's worked out immensely well for me personally, uh, for our whole family. And, and I think, uh, I'm sure Mike would echo this, that it's worked out extremely well for all the new shareholders in the company. So that's, that's been the icing on the cake for me.